expert with uh, <laughs> Zoom. No, don't. <laughs> okay. I'll uh, put myself on mute. I'll leave you to it, Jane. Okay. Um, but in the meantime, I was saying I've had a preview of some of these photos and they are absolutely marvellous. I'm really looking forward to them. It. It's obviously a very exciting adventure, uh, which involves all sorts of um, things going on. Um, and of course, a very spectacular part of the world and coming into South Africa, just as COVID was um, ticking off. So um, I'm expecting to be enthralled. Um, I, I, I imagine the best thing is if um, Andrew gives his presentation. Maybe I'll put you on mute now. <laughs> um, okay. If Andrew gives his presentation and then at the end we have questions, that's probably easier given the format that we've got. So um, we'll leave it maybe another minute, um, Andrew, in case we have any more coming, but good turnout. And um, we're very much looking forward to, to what you're about to tell us. Okay, can you hear me then, Jane? Because we just unmuted ourselves. Perfectly, thank okay. you. Well, no one else obviously coming in, so I guess you can you can probably start. Okay, thanks, Jane. So, uh, hello everyone, and uh, thanks thanks so much for taking time to to listen to the story. Uh, I hope you enjoy it, and um, I've been advised to keep it under an hour, so I may end up leaving a few areas out um, in order to achieve that. But um, I'm also going to leave my email ID, so if anybody wants to talk about this afterwards either for get a deeper dive into any particular area or if you've got plans to do it yourself um, or you want to share stories if you've done it yourself before then love to uh, love to catch up when uh, covid allows uh, i'm a new member of the yacht club um, so i put this talk together without really knowing much about uh, the audience and that's always dangerous as we know um, i do know we have some listeners who are not big sailors so there's a few points during the presentation where I will uh, just explain a few things that may be second nature to some of you. So please just bear with me if I do that. Uh, Mo and I have just bought a boat actually, um, which should take, <laughs> we should take delivery of uh, at the boat show. And uh, that will allow us to get down to the, uh, the yacht club a bit more and actually do some more local sailing. So really looking forward to doing that when time allows. But at the end of the day, I hope there's something in this presentation, uh, along the lines Jane was saying really, that something that will, uh, be there for everyone there's we're going to probably show about 100 pictures so this powerpoint is all pictures and no text uh, and as i sort of rabbit on uh, my gorgeous wife mo beside me is going to try and sync with the photographs that i'm showing you um, so there'll be some areas i'm going to cover around the navigation and what it was actually like sailing on tecla uh, there's quite a few pictures and stories about the wildlife we saw um, and then the uh, covid side of things which certainly became uh, very interesting as we went along. So context, the trip was taken between January and April last year. Uh, this picture shows you Tecla. Uh, so you can see the four lower sails. Uh, she had upper sails as well, which uh, we had up on various occasions. And I'll talk a bit about the sails and how we managed those. Um, and then a picture of yours truly and Port Lockroy on the bottom right. And this picture was used uh, an article that um, I was interviewed for and with the Sunday Times. So you may have seen it already if you read the Sunday Times, but uh, that's the context of it. And I'll come back to it a bit later. It was really driven by, by COVID. So I'll start by just sharing a little bit from a, uh, a book that was written by Paul Heine. Uh, that's just the uh, email I did if I need it. Okay, so I'm just gonna go up here. Okay. So as you can see from this slide, uh, I'm wearing a plaster cuss on my arm. Now, Paul Heine wrote a cruising guide for Cape Horn and Antarctic waters. And in the introduction to that book, he says the following, this book covers some of the most dangerous waters in the world. Be in no doubt that if you choose to sail into the areas described in this book, there will be times when you wish you were anywhere else. It will be tough, relentless, frightening and humbling and all in the space of a few hours tough sailing. That is all I can promise you for certain. So that's what he wrote. And I can assure you that that was mostly my experience. 
apart from wishing that I was somewhere else because I, I loved it. Uh, the irony, though, is that I found myself coming home, uh, coming home even riskier because less than a week after coming back to the UK, uh, I broke my hand slipping on the stairs in our little New Forest cottage, taking a cup of tea upstairs to mow. <laughs> so a broken hand in the calm of a New Forest cottage after uh, seven weeks and 5,000 nautical miles in some of the uh, roughest seas uh, that we, we know of. So at least the broken hand avoided me doing some DIY jobs, which is a good thing. So I said I'd say a few words about Tekla. Uh, so here's a few pictures for you to give different perspectives on her. Uh, I spent seven weeks on her and we covered about 5,000 nautical miles, so a lot of time and uh, distance. She was built in 1915 and started her life as a fishing vessel. She fished for five years and survived the First World War when many other fishing vessels came to an end by bombing. But by 1920, she was laid up and neglected. In 1989, she was launched as Tekla and started her new career uh, with her new owners who have taken her uh, in several, to several parts of the globe, including, as I say, the Arctic and the Antarctic. She's 38 meters overall length and length on deck is 27 meters. Her beam is six and a half meters and her draft is 2.7 meters. Uh, and when all sails up, she has a whopping 370 square meters of sail area and weighs 92 tons. So hopefully that gives you a very quick flavor of her size together with some of the beauty uh, that you can see through the pictures. The bowsprit, i.e. the long piece of wood sticking out the front, is huge but fully retractable uh, in a few minutes for entering small harbors. She has three sizes of flying jib and a four stay sail with a sheet on a sliding bar, which you can just about make out in the lower right picture. The main and mizzen masts are very, ham very heavy canvas and gaff rigged. They can be reefed and often wear reefed on this trip. And there's also a storm tricell. The mizzen mast sail came from the non-sailors, the one closest to the stern or the back of Tekla for those not familiar with these boats. The top sails are jackyard top sails. So you hoist the sail and an extra piece of mast or a jackyard extending both the mizzen and main mast upwards. And they're extremely heavy. If you've ever done it, you'll, you'll hopefully agree with that. Uh, it's an exciting job to do, especially when the boat is moving all over the place. Uh, but also a lot of fun, especially when it's coming down. So outside, Tekla, extremely beautiful and exciting sailing. Inside, you can see that Tekla uh, is a little bit cramped. Uh, on the right here, you can see the cabin that uh, my good friend, retired Merchant Navy Captain Stephen G and myself had. Uh, we traveled together and did the trip together. Uh, there are six paying crew cabins on Tekla, each cabin for two people. The cabins are situated down the midline of the Tekla, which makes them as stable as possible. Um, however, there are no lee cloths, and on several occasions, despite trying to pry up the mattresses, uh, a number of the crew were unsurprisingly separated from their bunks, uh, including both Stephen and myself being thrown from our bunks um, at various points on the journey. So beside the bunk beds there, there's a, a shower and a toilet combo and a very small uh, cupboard. That's, that's it. There was no drying room on Tekla, which you may be surprised about given uh, she's going to uh, such cold climates. But once you were wet, you were wet and you were likely to be going on your next watch still wet. So not much fun in the icy cold weather. And if you feel the cold, uh, it was a very, very tough voyage. So there were four paid crew on Tekla. And on the right, you can see who they are. Uh, kneeling at the, the left is uh, Heiss, who's the skipper, a Dutch skipper. Uh, Enki, the French first mate standing on the left. Johnny, who's a Chilean uh, guide and cook at the back right. And then Nico, uh, who is another Dutch uh, lad at the front right, who was second mate and wasn't being paid at all. He was taking two years off uni in order to sail around the, uh, sail around the globe with Tekla. And on the picture on the left, this is at Shackleton's grave, uh, South Georgia. And you can see the, um, uh, the crew that we had uh, with me at the, uh, the front. Uh, in the group, just to give you an idea of the background, we had two doctors and a nurse, so we were well looked after for any injuries, a graphic artist, an accountant, a BBC journalist, a retired merchant navy captain, a retired CIA agent, believe it or not, uh, and others. And by the time this picture was taken at Shackleton's grave on South Georgia, one crew member had already flown home because of extreme seasickness. Two of the ladies in this picture, um, spent over 70% of the entire journey in their bunk beds because of extreme seasickness. Uh, the Southern Ocean and the Drake Passage took no prisoners, and I'll share more of that later. 
Something I'm often asked about um, is the watch system that we used. Uh, well, Tecla had a three watch schedule. Uh, the one I was on, the white watch was from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. and from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. every day. Uh, so I was on watch for four hours, had eight hours off, then on again for four hours and then off again for eight hours. So within 24 hours, I was on watch for a total of eight hours. The watch that I had meant that I saw many beautiful sunrises and sunsets, which was uh, glorious. You can see from the cabin picture that we showed earlier, uh, the storage space was very limited. Soft bags only, as usual with sailing, I guess, and I carried 28 kilograms. Much of my, the weight was in the muck boots that I chose to take and the heavy weather sailing gear that was a must. Like walking, the general rule is to take as many layers as you can. Patrolling the deck at night on an ice watch is bone numbingly cold without several layers of clothing. Contrast this with walking, Shackleton's Crossing, in shorts and t-shirt or sunbathing reading on deck in the waters approaching Cape Town. So several layers needed. Another restriction, just out of interest, if you're planning something yourself, uh, was just due to the different airlines that we took and the different luggage restrictions. And the hardest item of all to manage were the items in my camera gear. So I ended up wearing my muck boots on the RAF flight that we took to the Falklands, together with my Polar Expedition jacket onto the flight. And it's amazing how much camera gear you can fit into the pockets of that uh, jacket. So another question that's often asked, uh, again, when you see the slides afterwards, um, you'll have reference to these, but is what bu books or maps did we use? The Paul Heine cruising guide that I quoted from earlier uh, was often used by me before, during and after the trip. Uh, other books and maps are shown in the, this picture and the next uh, picture. And something I did here, which I also did on the Camino, which I know some on this call have also done the Camino, uh, was I photographed a lot of the books and stored the photographs on my phone or iPad. Uh, and that saved an awful lot of weight, but still led me access to a lot of the content. I didn't take a laptop. Uh, a number of people did for their photography. I just took a lot of memory cards uh, and a backup device for the photographs. So to the journey itself then. Um, so in January, Stephen, uh, retired Merchant Navy captain, as I said, and myself landed at Mount Pleasant Air Base on East Falkland Island after an 18 hour flight on an RAF air tanker A330 plane. Uh, interesting thing about these RAF flights is there was no alcohol, no reclining seats, no entertainment system, and you have to check in four hours before the flight. So it's a bit different to uh, commercial flights. There was a landing at Cape Verde for refueling and a crew change and the usual mid route landing was Ascension Island, but the runway there is, was being repaired and still is being repaired as we speak. On the Falklands, if you've ever been there, you'll know this, but there are very few cars and there's only one petrol station on the whole island in the capital, Port Stanley, and that one closes at 6.30 in the evening. So you do need to uh, be prepared. Stephen and I hired a four by four and drove over 250 miles around the East Falkland Island in one day. We visited the Argentinian and the British War Memorials and also visited Goose Green, Darwin, San Carlos and many other sites, connected by what could be called road, but was more like off-road. The war memorials felt like an honourable and a beautiful resting place for the fallen. In many places across the island, we found small crosses set in honour of an individual or in honour of a small group who had fallen at that spot. There were so many that we lost count. After this, we drove to Cape Pembroke Lighthouse where there was a memorial for the Atlantic conveyor that you can see in the top left here. The prop shaft is angled at 62 degrees, pointing to the area where she was lost 90 miles offshore. Uh, the Atlantic Conveyor Wreck is now rightly designated as a protected place under the Protection of Military Remains Act. I'm also posting uh, here, you can see in the bottom right, the beautiful San Carlos British Memorial, uh, which has this wonderful, beautiful view over a bay. And after the hell they went through, uh, I do think it is a beautiful resting place. And then you can see on the bottom left, a typical Falklands landscape. And again, the context there is not only is it quite beautiful and uh, I guess bare, but this is the land that the, the soldiers were marching over in pretty treacherous conditions. Uh, and just outside Stanley itself, uh, there's a, a small hill which I hiked up to see a commemorative plaque dedicated to the Welsh Guards and also the memorial for the corpse of the Royal Engineers. On our second day, we spent time walking across some of the beautiful landscapes in the Falklands watching the wildlife, and I called it my penguin day because of the close encounters with the megalanic penguins which are abundant on the East Island. The picture you can see here is of Gypsy Cove, which is a gorgeous bay about 10 minutes drive away from Stanley. However, it was roped off 
and had several signs warning of mines. We happened to meet some folks from Zimbabwe while we were walking in this area, uh, and those folks were stationed there to help with the mine clearance, a task which needs to be thoroughly planned, of course. They said they were employed here because of all their experience having cleared mines across Africa. So a horrible reminder of not only what the Falkland Islanders have had to live with since the Falklands War all those years ago, but also of the horrors that took place across Rhodesia and Zimbabwe and Africa. The Falkland Islands, I'm really pleased to say, are now mine free, which was a milestone which was reached last summer. You can see some of the penguins. Um, we saw some of them on the Gypsy Cove pictures. And also here you can see some of the megalanic uh, penguins that are uh, burrowing penguins. So they disappear off into their, their burrows. Um, and on the next slide, you can see some other bits of the wildlife, a turkey vulture native to the islands, the uh, gray headed uh, black crowned night heron, which is the only native heron. And again, a little uh, Magellanic penguin just disappearing into its burrow in the bottom left. And the last thing I thought I'd show you on the Falklands before we get to the, uh, the sailing part was the, uh, the red post box and uh, the phone boxes outside Stanley post office. Uh, they also have a red London bus in, in Stanley, so uh, lots of lots of connections. Having left the Falklands, we flew to Punta Arenas in Chile and joined Tecla on the 2nd of February. Uh, we're a day late because of very strong winds on the Falklands, 35 knots from the north, uh, which closed the airport. The airport on the Falklands only had one runway, and so if winds were strong and from the wrong direction, then the airport simply closed. Uh, quickly for the non-sailors, a knot is roughly equal to a mile per hour, uh, for the sake of this presentation, it is anyway. So if I say something like 10 knots, just think of 10 miles per hour. Uh, a knot is actually a bit bigger than a mile per hour, but uh, uh, just for the sake of those non-sailors, just think of it that way. We were in time when we got to um, Chile for an evening meal, which was a great opportunity to meet the rest of the crew. Um, but it's probably worth uh, just mentioning that we couldn't have missed another day due to bad weather, because if we had, Tecla would have had to sail without us. So that was a nervous couple of days for Stephen and myself as we... Uh, joined Tecla. Before we left Punta Arenas, we had to load barrels of diesel below deck. I say we, uh, but I mean Nico, the second mate. Um, it was a good job. He was thin and wiry uh, and not claustrophobic because he had to operate in some very tight and dark space as he squeezed all the barrels of diesel into place below deck. Uh, he was covered in diesel and had a massive headache from the stench of diesel when he finally finished his task and came up top. Uh, but he was helped in his recovery from that diesel smell by the wonderful aroma of fresh bread filling the air on board Tecla. That baking of bread was a daily occurrence across the whole trip uh, and was absolutely wonderful. Even in the gales and severe gales, uh, we baked bread. Or Johnny did, bless him. We left Punta Arenas early on a beautiful but chilly morning, started under engines down the Straits of Magellan on a course of 160 degrees compass, heading eventually for the Beagle Canal and aiming to exit Chile itself at Porto Williams. So I'm not sure if you know this already, but Chile uses the Isla B as its system of voyage, the opposite to the UK, which uses Isla A, and it's often remembered as red right returning. Also, the direction of voyage is north to south in the Straits of Magellan, and it was advised, strongly advised, that Chilean charts were used. We were forewarned to reference the Chilean Authority SHOA site because the Armada, who are the Chilean Navy, are updating charts to apply corrections to the various datums, especially as you go further south so that they all agree with WGS 84. Errors of up to two miles in discrepancy between chart and GPS position have been noted further south. It's also important to know that some areas of Antarctica have not even been surveyed, and at times we had to sail with extreme caution. We had all the usual electronic systems on board and a sextant which we used. Um, and maybe another interesting point to, to mention for you is the variations this far down uh, the earth were very high. So at one point we were steering compass east, and making 054 degrees true over the ground. Lastly, and of course typical of a sailing vessel, lots of navigation decisions were made on where we thought the best winds would be. Like many ships of her type, Tecla hates downwind sailing, so we wanted to try and keep her on a reach or even close hauled as often as we could. We used sat phone to download a variety of grip files for, for weather apps like Windy, and then we made decisions on what they were indicating, plus what we could see with our own eyes. Anyway, back to departing Punta Arenas along the Magellan Strait. After an hour or so of heading into a very gentle breeze, which uh, you can see me sailing here and you can see uh, some of the peaks in the background, um, the sails took shape. There was some new terminology for me to come to terms with, such as jiggers, which are block assisted and hence easier to pull, system on the far end of a halyard makes it much easier to get these heavy sails up. 
The snow-capped Andes came into view at late morning. And one of the mountain peaks conveniently sat at 160 degrees from the ship, making the sailing reasonably straightforward. This first day's passage had to run for approximately 60 hour, 20 hours, sorry, as we needed to reach a safe anchorage point with a good margin of time for error before a forecast gale hit the area. Far stronger winds were forecast than those which had forced our LATAM flight from the Falklands to be delayed for 24 hours. Looking at the windy app, I could see a huge patch of deep red was heading our way. The gale came as forecast and was a baptism of fire. 40 knots of wind and chaotic water gave us some idea of what might be ahead of us. We rode that gale out with a storm jib and a reefed mizzen. The gale eventually passed and we anchored in Brecknock Bay that you can see here. A beautiful and very sheltered bay with a catamaran out of sight and a yacht also out of sight already tied up in a couple of sheltered spots. For those of you who may be looking at a chart or a map, we got to Brecknock Bay from Punta Arenas via the Straits of Magellan, Canal Magdalena, Canal Coburn and Paso Brecknock. In the morning over breakfast in this bay, Johnny, our natural history guide, gave us a briefing, a very interesting description of the different habitats and species found in this region. We're still on our way to Port of Williams, which is the southernmost city in the world, and it will be our exit point from an immigration perspective from Chile, heading down towards Cape Horn. In Brecknock Bay, we left Tecla and our tender to go ashore for a lovely hike. Not a lot of wildlife around, but lovely waterfalls and inland lakes and gorgeous views such as this one back to Tecla. Back on board after the hike, it was all sails hoisted, quite a feat as I said on this ship. Everything is very heavy and needs many hands and excellent coordination in pulling and heaving the lines. In addition, I carried the jib sail with its, from its storage to the bow of the ship with two other folks, and we only just made it, it was so heavy. With all sails up, the mizzen, the main, the fore and the jib, the ship made good speed with a pronounced heel. We navigated along Canal Balanero and Canal Beagle, passing some wonderful glaciers. There are three natural passages between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, the Magellan Strait, the Drake Passage, and the Beagle Channel. The Beagle is the most sheltered of the three, and its discovery meant that ships have had a relatively easy, if tight, passage through the channel and to, between the two oceans. It's probably also worth mentioning that in Chilean waters, as uh, travel is strictly controlled, to travel from one port to another requires a permit called a ZARPI, usually issued by the Navy. The ZARPI details the route you must take, and this far south, the Armada and the Customs and Police are very, very strict about vessels keeping to route. Sailing from Brecknock Bay, we saw beautiful glaciers, as I said, and a lot of seabird activity, eventually entering a gorgeous bay called Coleta Orla in the early evening and anchoring with two stern lines ashore. Most of us went for a two hour hike uh, with a naturalist guide, Johnny. Lots of beaver activity and lots of what looked like a Tolkien forest leading up to a hidden glacier. Then back to the beach by the boat for an evening barbecue. Beavers swang, swam around and came ashore. Johnny played the Bolivian equivalent of a 10-string ukulele and then sang some Chilean songs on a guitar. The stars came out, beautiful stars, Orion clear but upside down, and the Southern Cross very visible. So this is uh, Tecla with its two anchors. We retired to bed and left for Port of Williams at four o'clock in the morning. At Port of Williams, several crew disembarked to buy snacks and other items. This was the last chance they were going to get before uh, reaching uh, much more civilization. And after completing the customs and immigration formalities, we then left Port of Williams at 8 p.m. that day for a night sail. We were accompanied along the main channel by several cruise ships, but they veered off towards the Falklands as we turned south towards Cape Horn. And we hoped to reach Cape Horn at about nine o'clock or so, and we'd been given permission to set foot on Cape Horn if weather permitted. We had an amazing sight just before we went to bed at the end of our shift when we saw flying fish at the bow chased by six dolphins glowing like aliens in the luminescence and moonlight. It was quite stunning. We continued to sail all the way to Cape Horn through the Friday evening and Saturday morning. And this place with such a notorious reputation was now basked in glorious sunshine and calm weather. We were able to anchor off the Horn Rock and having obtained prior permission from the Chilean authorities, we were able to take a tender ashore Hence, we found ourselves on the rock for two hours. We met the family who live there, a husband who provides three hourly meteorological updates around the clock, his wife who runs the national park, which is what the Horn Rock is, and her two small children and a gorgeous dog. Our passports were stamped with the Cape Horn stamp, and we were able to spend time in the small chapel and to view the memorial to the many seafarers who have died in these waters. You can see those pictures also attached. 
By 4 p.m., we set off south for Drake Passage because the skipper Heist was uneasy about staying too long, and rightly so. Most of you will have heard of Drake Passage. It is some of the roughest waters in the world, as two oceans meet over the shallow depths south of Chile, far worse than the Bay of Biscay. If any of you have ever sailed south from the English Channel down to the Med and experienced the Bay of Biscay, you'll know what I mean. Because of the abrupt change from deep to shallow waters, just like the Drake Passage, the Bay of Biscay seas can be extremely rough, even gale force in moderate weather. In fact, the UK government advice for yachts entering the Drake Passage or crossing the Drake Passage is as follows, and I quote, most of the commercial yachts operating regularly in these waters have been knocked down and several have been rolled through 360 degrees. Any skipper should be mindful of this when preparing a vessel for this crossing. That day, despite that sunshine on the rock, in the Drake Passage, the forecast was north and northeast winds of between 20 and 25 knots, a force six on uh, Beaufort terms. Good winds for sailing on a broad reach, our course was 150. But however, very soon after leaving Cape Horn, reefed well, we experienced a three meter swell or more, winds of 35 knots gusting 45, which is a gale gusting to a severe gale and some of the crew felt very sick and retired to their beds already. For the open water sail, netting was erected along both sides of the ship to help man overboard scenarios, but there was no clipping on. Tekla had radar and AIS, and this was already very important as this evening the sea, vo sea fog enveloped us from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. We couldn't see anything for the last two hours of our watch, and as there is no autopilot on Tekla, we had to steer by the compass and share the helm in 20 minute segments. Although still quite far north, we had to be very alert, most times a radar hit was accompanied by an AIS information symbol so we could identify the hidden vessel. At other times, we would have a radar hit, but no AIS. And that could be a yacht without AIS or perhaps a rogue northerly iceberg. So we started an iceberg watch early in our southerly journey. When we came back on deck at 4 a.m. on the Sunday morning for our watch, it was very cold, but a clear blue sky. Stephen had been rolled out of his bunk the previous evening by the rocking of the swell. We witnessed several wandering albatross birds and brown petrels. And as many of you will know, wandering and royal albatross birds have wingspans of up to 12 feet. These birds are the master aviators of those stormy southern seas. They breed biennially with lifelong mates and return to the same subantarctic hilltops and the same nesting mounds for many years. Johnny played his ukulele beautifully for nearly an hour, and this became a common occurrence on our journey. We were approaching the convergence zone at this point, this foggy 20 to 30 mile wide temperate boundary, temperature boundary marks the area where cold nutrient rich Antarctic waters plunge beneath nutrient poor tropical seas. And at the convergence northern edge, air and sea temperatures drop precipitously. Crossing this boundary marks a rapid change in the sea life, which becomes visible. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'd gotten up very early to have a shower, which was quite an experience as I'm sure many of you have experienced at sea um, since the weather had worsened in Drake Passage. Staying upright and stable in the shower was not easy and many bruises resulted. More and more of the crew were succumbing to seasickness, four in total that morning. The winds were 17 knots increasing to 24 with a northerly wind backing west as the morning went on. But now it was a four metre swell that was making people sick and making helming and simply standing up difficult. We crossed the 60 degree latitude, south latitude line, which was the time to lower our Chilean flag. The main and mizzen sails were reefed to first reef, which helped balance the boat and take us beyond nine knots. We saw hourglass dolphins as the moon rose in the northeast. Biosecurity is a major concern in Antarctica, and now we were given our first instruction of many as to how to do everything we can to protect the environment, the wildlife, and deter accidental introduction of new species to anywhere we visit. Extremely important activity. It took us two days through Drake Passage to reach Antarctica at midnight on the 11th of February, in the end, it had earned every part of its reputation. Huge swells, which made the ship turn like a corkscrew. Water everywhere on deck and in the crew's clothing. Driving, freezing rain that tested my storm gear to the limit. And for the record, my gloves failed, but the rest of the gear stood the test. Exhausting work at the helm, and given so many ill crew, we were shorthanded. The rain drove so hard into our faces that it stung skin and eyes alike. I'd been advised to take ski goggles, which I had, and that helped protect the eyes. Everyone who completed their four hour watch was frozen and tired. We were lucky we were on watch that sighted Antarctica. We had to go slowly and keep a very close eye out, eye out for ice and icebergs, both of which we saw. Anchor was dropped in Port Lockroy early in the hours of the 12th. 
We passed the leopard seal that you can see here in the right hand picture as we entered Port Lockroy. Leopard seals are second only to killer whales in how dangerous they are, and we were warned never to step out of a tender any time there was a leopard seal nearby. After a sleep and breakfast, we took a tender ashore to visit the British Antarctic base. Lovely young people who were very enthusiastic about their role on the base. After visiting the base, we went for a walk amongst the Gen 2 penguins. It was a big colony with many young chicks between eight weeks and three months old. The chicks were molting, as you'll see in some later pictures. And we also saw a basking elephant seal that you can see in the lower left here. Gen 2 penguins make shallow pebble nests on flat terrain, including granite outcrops, and mated pairs of Gen 2s greet each, greet each other with calls that sound like two noted donkey brays. They're very different to the burrowing Magellanic penguins which we'd experienced in the Falklands. After dinner, and from 11 p.m. to midnight, I covered my solo ice watch. It was a light rain, and I had my raincoat on with a hood and listened to music on my headphones as I walked the deck looking for dangerous ice or anchor slippage. Very therapeutic and calming, almost like a meditation. However, this was serious business as ice is treacherous. I had to use a boat hook to push icebergs the size of cars away from the boat. And I soon learned that the secret is not to push fast, just apply a steady and sure pressure. And eventually, sometimes in minutes, the ice gradually changes direction, which is very satisfying when it does. We had a six o'clock start scheduled as we headed even further south. And by now, just for your record, we were 65 degrees south. The Antarctic Peninsula's mountain ranges are a continuation of the South American Andes linked by a submarine arc. The South Orkney Islands, the South Sandwich Islands and South Georgia Island are peaks of this undersea mountain chain. The West Antarctic Ice Sheet and the Peninsula Tell pointing to South America is the part Tekla explored in minute part on the journey. The peninsula is warming up more rapidly than almost anywhere else on Earth. And the West Antarctic Ice Sheet is the vulnerable ice sheet down here based on slippery wet rocks that could send it sliding into the sea. Though it's the smaller of the two ice sheets in Antarctica, amazingly, it still contains enough ice to raise sea levels around the world by three and a half metres. Departing Port Lockroy towards our next stop at Paradise Bay, we saw lots of icebergs and dramatic scenery, almost like another planet, eerie and demanding respect. We're dressed for the extreme cold now, and in my case, two pairs of merino wool socks inside thermally lined muck boots, two sets of thermal underwear, shirt and then fleece, and then salopettes, waterproof and thermal trousers under the salopettes, Burkhouse waterproof trousers over the salopettes, and Henri Lloyd offshore train sailing overcoat, two neck scarves, a woolly hat, and extreme weather gloves. And the gloves were the only item that failed me, as I said. Paradise Bay is where the Chilean uh, military base is stationed, comprising of Navy and Air Force personnel. A beautiful bay, but with a lot of sea ice. The military staff greeted us with tea and biscuits in full uniform and gave us a traditional Chilean dessert of prune and pearl barley plus juice. Absolutely delicious. Lots of Gen 2 penguins were around the base and a sign showed that it was still over 2,000 kilometres to the South Pole. The Chilean base had a full-size gym, a film room, a bar, a lounge, everything you might reasonably expect for living in such an environment. Whilst here, we used the tender to take us ashore for a long uphill walk. And at the foot of the hill, we saw a colony of Gen 2 penguins. And as you can see here, a basking Weddell seal. Weddell seals have faces that look like smiling but earless Cheshire cats. And these seals remain on the ice as far south as 78 degrees during the winter, the only seal species to do so. We climbed the hill through slippery penguin poo, masses of it, all that pink brown stuff that you can see here and people were slipping all over. The muck boots did not do well here. Another option chosen by folks, chosen by folks was to have hiking boots with waterproof over boots. <clears throat> and the hiking boots had much better grip. Some had clip on crampons for their boots, which was my backup, uh, backup option as it happened. This Gen 2 penguin looks like our dog Jasper after walks in the new forest on wet, muddy days. And since I mentioned Jasper, uh, here he is, 14 years old in this picture, bless him. Higher on the now very rocky hill, we saw more Gen 2 penguins, some molting, and, and we also saw chinstrap penguins. Here's a hip molting penguin for you. You can see how clear, clearly it's molting. Uh, we also saw chinstrap penguins, uh, as you can see in this picture. And they have head markings of black feathers, and they look like, uh, it's been noted in books, but I think they do look like it. They look like they're wearing World War I helmets with black chinstraps under their chin. We also saw, here's another couple of chinstrap penguins. Beautiful birds, aren't they? 
We also saw several skewer birds and some of the skewers flew right at us. And we soon realized this one, by the way, is, is one coming right at me. And I was actually falling over backwards as I took this picture. Uh, I hadn't realized, um, and I'm not that close. I had an 800 millimeter lens on the camera for this picture. Um, but seeing that through the lens, I still fell over backwards. So it's a lucky shot. Uh, but the reason they were coming after us is they were protecting their babies. Uh, we had fantastic views from the top. Uh, and as we descended, we saw a whale skeleton and a dangerous leopard seal in the water. Sadly, their primary food sources are penguins uh, and crab eater seal pups. As predators, leopard seals are second only to killer whales for stealth. They lurk beneath thin sheets of pack ice, waiting for telltale penguin shadows from above. And when the seals detect the penguins marching across the ice, they'll suddenly crash through and grab, grab the poor little things. Leaving Paradise Bay, on the 14th of February, we passed through massive ice fields, northwards having to be very careful and slow. At this point, we were sailing through the Galash Strait, for those of you who might be following on a chart still. My lovely wife had hidden lots of little Valentine gifts for me in my luggage as a surprise. And these pictures that most has gone through there show you what we saw on that little journey north. We traveled onwards to Enterprise Island and dropped anchor next to a wreck. The wreck here you can see is the decaying hulk of a whaling ship, the Governoran. Being alongside this wreck is said to be the nearest thing to being in a marina in Antarctica. It's quite a tricky maneuver getting alongside and in this picture you can see us alongside. We saw seals sleeping on ice floes and humpback whales swimming whilst at anchor. We must conserve water very carefully on a ship like this. Um, it does have a salination, desalination machine which can produce about 400 litres a day, uh, but we do need to be careful. Some folks, because of a lack of a drying room and a lack of hot showers very often, suffered from the continuous chill that we faced. We, on the next part of our journey, we saw several active sea lions while heading even further northeast for an anchor, anchorage on the south side of Trinity Island. Our next stop was to target it to be Deception Island. However, we had a gale, forced, gale forecast winds coming from the east for the next two days. So we needed to get to Deception Island today if we were gonna make it at all. We'd then beat eastwards in gale force winds over the next few days. What fun that was going to be. The island you can see in this picture is called Deception Island because the winds can be stronger inside, even though it seems like an enclosed bay within the cold era. The strong catabatic winds are the reason. It was cold, snowing and windy as we entered Neptune's bellows. Um, just for those who don't know, catabatic winds are gravity winds. Uh, in this case, coming down off the snow-capped mountains and they can be very strong. Fur seals were hunted to within a hair, of, an air, a hair of extinction here in the 1820s, after which Deception Island offered no economic attractions for ships and crews. Many Antarctic travel brochures feature the steamy thermal waters at Pendulum Cove, Antarctica's version of an outdoor spa. Although this looks like fun, the water temperature can suddenly rise to the boiling point. However, it didn't deter the crew of Tekla. We anchored off Pendulum Cove on Deception Island for the night as the water was calm even though extremely strong catabatic winds came down over the Caldera overnight. On the Monday, we finally left Deception Island, heading for False Bay on Livingston Island in the South Shetland Islands. Black-browed and wandering albatross birds glided above us in their perpetual search for churned up krill. As you can see in this picture, that is krill. Small shrimp-like crustaceans that amazingly form the largest biomass on earth. All the krill in the Antarctic added together weighs more than all human beings on the earth. At this point, we were sailing through the Bransfield Strait, which was studded with icebergs. We had to be very, very careful in sailing through it as the icebergs were plentiful. Sunlight illuminates the icebergs near the South Shetland Islands, reflecting all the beautiful gradations of color from an emerald green to that of the finest blue. Yet for all their beauty, icebergs were more often feared than the notorious Great Passage storms. Falses Bay teems with broken ice, penguins and fur seals. They look cute. Sorry, I'm just getting the pictures on to show you. <clears throat> Falses Bay's team with broken ice, as I said, and the loads and loads of uh, penguins and fur seals. They look cute, but their bites can be nasty. And the bites from these little creatures that you can see here are the cause of most medical situations from tourists down here. There are many foreboding names that this far south, such as Danger Islands, Despair Rocks, Cape Disappointment, Exasperation Inlet, Cape Longing, and the Shackleton Fracture Zone, and many more. We then headed on to another 
uh, island, Discovery Bay, sailing most of the way, a short hop really in the grand scheme of things down here. By now, almost half the folks on board were seasick after yesterday's passage, a rough ride through gale force winds. Fortunately, Stephen and I were both okay. Chile's Captain Arturo Park Pratt Station in Discovery Bay on Greenwich Island is a year round research base established on Discovery Bay on the island's north side. I had a long chat in English with the meteorologist who very enthusiastically talked me through his role and told me about the very bad weather that was due tomorrow. Next to the chapel was a cross in memorial of the Navy and Air Force men lost here in December 2019. They were on a flight to Antarctica from Punta Arenas, which came down en route. Some bodies and plane parts were covered, but the commander says that they do not yet know the cause of the crash. He was quietly spoken as he told us that many of the men who died in that crash were destined for his base and command. Despite the horrible forecast, our aim the following day was to head north to Elephant Island. It was a bitterly cold morning due to the catabatic winds soaring down over the ice. Due to the foul weather, the skipper made the call that there was zero chance of making a landing on Elephant Island, and hence it would have been straight on to South Georgia. I say would have, since we've also just been told at that point that South Georgia changed its rules and a boat of our length, by only two centimetres, mind you, two centimetres too long, must have rat traps on anchor chains and mooring lines if we wanted to approach South Georgia waters. Unfortunately, we didn't have anything on board, so all that was allowed for us was to change course for the Falklands and the Drake Passage it was once more. South Georgia had spent several years eradicating its rats and didn't want any vessels bringing rats back. So we raised the sails, those heavy sails, and started back up Drake's Passage in snowy weather and a strong swell. I spent a lot of hours in the engine room trying to resolve a problem with our water supply, which turned out to be a damaged pump, which he eventually found and fixed. The sky was glorious, I, because I, my love of astronomy pointed out several constellations to my fellow watch members and talked about what was happening to Betelgeuse at the time. If many of you were following the news, you'll have seen that there was a fascinating story evolving about what was happening to Betelgeuse and whether it might have gone supernova. The following day in the Drake Passage was very cold, wet and stormy, but a good day sailing. I'm just going to move on a bit just to uh, keep up with time. Uh, just to let you know, we got to the Falklands through uh, gales and severe gales. Um, we actually hit a force 10 um, on this trip north, um, 48 to 55 knots of wind. So a pretty stormy passage back up the Drake Passage, even worse than the one coming down. But we finally dropped anchor in Stanley. Um, directly opposite the governor's house. One of the paying crew at this point got off um, and went home just because of his extreme seasickness and his worry about an evolving heart problem. Um, so the best for him was just to fly home. A lovely guy and we all wished him well. After completing the required paperwork to leave the Falklands, loading a lot more fresh fruit and veg on board, refueling and securing the rat traps, we departed and started our journey towards South Georgia. So Mo's now going to take you through a sequence of around 20 to 25 slides while I keep talking and she'll show you some of the glorious South Georgia nature. We had about 600 nautical miles to cover on the way down and we were estimating about five days of travel. At this point we had to carry out the biosecurity measures that are strictly enforced around South Georgia and these included using picks and sellotape to remove all possible seeds from the velcro closing mechanisms on our clothes, a long and very boring but very necessary process. The swell was still with us as we made our way south. The island's South At Atlantic location makes it a prime target for an endless series of atmospheric depressions that lambast it with gale force winds, stinging sleet and 60 foot swells. Local phenomena also contribute to the dangerous weather conditions. I think around 50 vessels have been wrecked or abandoned around South Georgia since 1800 because of violent storms. After the sighting of South Georgia, we started to see more and more wildlife, um, but even more preparation now for our clothing. I ended up using a Henry vacuum cleaner to hoover out all of my pockets and seams on my outdoor gear. And there'll be numerous more checks as we disembark and the guardians as they are called, check us to make sure we're not bringing any contamination onto the island. At our point uh, on arrival in Grit Vicken, we were welcomed by the local immigration officer who did all the checks as I've just described. Um, and we were allowed to go ashore um, to visit the whaling station at Grubicken. The views, the next day we covered, the, just looking at some of the views that Mo's showing you now, uh, which give you a perspective on what uh, South Georgia looked like, absolutely gorgeous. 
we started a walk so that we could uh, get off the boat for a bit and actually see part of the island. And you can see some of the views that we had on our walk, including the one that Mo's currently got on, got off on screen. The views back towards Gritviken were stunning. And we just caught Tekla leaving the bay under power, headed to another bay to pick us up. Halfway across the pass, we came across a large captive lake, which was so quiet, you could only hear the gentle water. Uh, and a number of folks went skinny dipping there, although I have to admit I didn't. Coming down the far side of the pass, we passed several babies' fur seal lions, their usual playful, aggressive selves. Many of the walkers had lots of seeds stuck in their clothing when we got back to the boat, and that had to be removed to prevent this inter-island contamination. And of course, boots needed to be disinfected again. Once we were all on board, the sails were hoisted and off we set for Ocean Harbour. The winds started to build strongly, and certainly reached 25 knots, perhaps gusting 30 for 35 on the short passage, with Tekla rolling and pitching extensively. So hopefully you followed some of those slides that Mo was going through as I talked a little bit about the biosecurity measures that South Georgia had. Um, and hopefully those slides and pictures give you a flavour of some of the beauty. The next day, within 15 minutes, we were headed deep into what transpired to be a 478. After about two hours of worsening conditions, the bowsprit snapped. And on this picture, you can see the snapped bowsprit. It's a heavy piece of timber and had to be somehow quickly, safely and tightly secured. And you can see from the picture what the damage was and hopefully gives you a good idea of the power of the oceans. We actually believe we were hit by a rogue wave or a particular type of rogue wave known, known as three sisters waves, where a rogue wave is strictly defined to be at least twice as high as the significant wave height at the time. Uh, we think we got hit by that and that snapped this bowsprit. We had to stop and uh, fix the, the bowsprit. And we, and we did that just through some lashings really to allow us to carry on. And from that point on, we could only really use the storm jib on that, uh, on that bowsprit. We saw several fur seals again, playing havoc on the beaches as we were trying to get out of the tenders. And then we motored our way to Stromness Bay and stayed there for the evening. So we could walk what is known as Shackleton's Walk the following day. By the way, that broken bowsprit costs 50,000 euros to replace. Okay. So leaving South Georgia and finishing that uh, Shackleton walk, we spent many days in the wilderness of the Southern Ocean. Um, and I think the Southern Ocean could be quite boring to write about because many days sort of merged into the others. But slowly that bitter cold started to disappear as we went north and north, um, but the swell was a bit of a killer. Um, the Southern Ocean is notorious. Uh, you probably know that from uh, just your life in sailing and also from watching things like the Vendee Globe. It is notorious. Back. We're done. Oh, no. I'm just going to go back a little bit here. There we go. Uh, it's notorious. And what we found is we had lots of different swells, at least three swells from three different directions actually coming at us, which made the helming uh, incredibly difficult to do. And we also found that it was a real slog and the seasickness just increased dramatically. I think by this stage, we had halfway across the Southern Ocean, we had about half of the crew that were seasick. So we were extremely shorthanded and having to manipulate the sails. At one point we had all four sails up uh, as well as the upper sails. And that was all being done by a, a vastly shortened crew. So arms felt they had, like, they had a real workout after a 30 minute slot at the helm. Tekli was heeled over quite a way despite sailing on a beam reach. Uh, and it must have been the amount of canvas, I think, that we had uh, at various points across the Southern Ocean. The marked heel with the huge swell meant that simple stuff like walking around the ship was dangerous. People were slipping and sliding all the time. Changing or showering or going to the toilet or sleeping or making drinking coffee or tea were all activities filled with risk. At points, china and coffee pots were flying around. And in my view, below deck was far more dangerous than being up top. At this point, we were hoping that we would make Tristan to Kuna in four or five days, as it was still a thousand nautical miles away. But this was the point at which we started to hear about rising concerns over a new virus. The port authorities in Tristan were concerned about the new virus and wanted assurances that we were clear of it. So I've not said anything about clock management either up until this point, and it's probably worth a few words um, in this last part of this presentation. We were now on GMT minus one, as we shifted clocks forward by one hour on the 7th. Cape Town was GMT plus two, so we still had three hours of clock adjustment ahead. 
The temperature was warming up day by day and I could stop wearing thermal clothing. And now it was a quieter ship as people started reading their books, uh, lying in more and just getting used to their watch system without too much other than the swells. Having looked at the sea charts for Tristan da Cunha, it was of interest to see the high magnetic variation there, um, as much as 14 degrees, three, three miles off Tristan da Cunha. So that meant the true difference, the difference between true north and com compass, um, if you took into account variation as well, could be as much as 24 degrees. We kept hearing more and more news about the virus as we progressed. <clears throat> and, it, and I think it was, yes, it was around about five o'clock on the 10th of March, the Island Council on Tristan da Cunha finally decided to block all traffic from entering the harbour. So hence, we immediately changed course to head for Cape Town. Um, and if we could keep the speed up that we had at this time, we'd probably be there in about 10 days. In the open ocean, as I said, days tend to merge into a standard routine. But we now heard that Holland had now had 20 deaths due to the virus and had given instruction to close all schools. The parliament in Cape Town was voting today re what action to take on the virus. And at that point, there had been no reported cases in Cape Town. Over the past four days of our passage, we'd had a high pressure system over us. We had a day under engine as loan as that high passed and the swell was made even more considerable under power. As time went on, all that was really interesting us is what was happening to the virus and what could we do with our, uh, with our vessel when we, when we entered Cape Town. We'd actually negotiated an entry to Cape Town as crew and hence we were on a crew visa, but we then had to leave the country by the 25th of the March latest. I managed to change my BA flight to the 24th with the invaluable help of my beautiful Mo. And little did we know that this was but one of many flight changes that we would need to make over the final days. The next day we sailed with all cluck up and we passed the 200 nautical mile point to Cape Town. It was wonderful to have this much sail up uh, and a bit of a mixed feeling as we came closer and closer to, the, to uh, Cape Town. Uh, a mixed feeling because it had been such a fabulous occasion but mixed because of what we were hearing about the virus and all our natural concerns about whether we were going to be able to get home. Finally, we could see the nighttime glow of Cape Town over the horizon. We were still 50 miles away, but the light pollution still lit up the low horizon. It was a strange mood that day, a combination of much excitement at completing the 5,000 nautical mile passage with all its adventures, but uncertainty about what COVID-19 held ahead. Our current brief was that we may not be able to disembark Tekla other than to travel to the airport. If that was the case, then we'd remain on board for a couple of days when we arrived at Cape Town and then head for the airport. But now we come to what happened right at the end of the trip, what happened in those final two days. We had free pratique as we entered Cape Town. Free pratique, for those who don't know, is the license given to a boat to enter port on assurance from the captain, which has convinced authorities that she is free from contagious disease. A ship can request free critique by flying a Q flag, which is a solid yellow flag, and flying the Q flag involves a request for boarding by port state control. If free critique is not granted, then a vessel is held in quarantine according to the customs and health regulations at the port of entry. Despite having free critique as we entered in Cape Town waters, we were not allowed entry into Cape Town's harbour. Unbeknownst to us in that same week, the Aida cruise liner that came into Cape Town on the 16th before the entry ban on vessels, let their guests and crew off the vessel, only later to find that six of them were infected with the COVID uh, virus. This had a great impact on the port of Cape Town. Their attitude towards this changed completely, despite us ha having the clean bill of health. The address to the nation of President Ramaphosa on the Monday was a further disaster for travelers in South Africa. Flights were thinning out. Apart from the harbour master, the health department, the coordination and planning of the port of Cape Town and the immigrations office, we called the chief harbour master of South Africa and the Dutch consul to help us out, given we were on a Dutch ship. They all agreed our case was a clear one, but getting us out of the bureaucracy was more difficult than expected. We'd now been waiting three days in a status where we had not been accepted into Cape Town, and hence we had to keep cancelling flights and trying to reschedule new dates and times. At this point, I began detailed conversations with the British consulate in South Africa and with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. In addition with Mo and the support of other loved ones at home, we built up media attention, which resulted in me giving an interview with the Sunday Times that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. This took up a lot of my day, providing details on crew status updates for all the nationalities on board, descriptions of our positions, answer to technical questions regarding the Tecla and much more. However, several deadlines passed, hopes were dashed and flights had to be rearranged. Eventually we got to the airspace lockdown date time 
and I had a flight booked for 6.45 p.m. on that date. The airspace was due to close at midnight. At 4 p.m. on the final day, we still had no clearance despite calls at the deputy commissioner level. I had to cancel my flight and I had a very tough and upsetting conversation with Mo about what appeared to be my only remaining option, which was to sail with Tecla for another three months or so back to the UK. I went back down below to unpack all my bags and to prepare myself for the sailing trip to the Azores, which was currently under lockdown. However, at 6 p.m. word came through that we could disembark if we had a flight out that evening confirmed. I called Mo, who miraculously got me a seat on the 9.30 BA flight. I ran down to pack again whilst the skipper secured his paperwork to release me. We were not connected ashore, just buffered against massive tires, tires twice my height, and I had to climb up the tire with all my luggage to escape. As soon as the skipper and I were up uh, onto the shore, we came across significant problem number one. The decision had not reached the local security guards from a national level. I had my itinerary and the skipper had his paperwork. So we ran with my luggage towards the guards. They were armed, but the guns were not raised and were screaming at us to stop. The gates were locked, as you can see in this picture. So we ran the other way to a place signed as immigration. It was empty and locked. Back we went to the gates and the guards and it was whilst crew were on the deck looking puzzled and concerned at our movements. A guard appeared on the other side of this locked gate and I called for him to open the gate based on the paperwork I had. He looked confused, but he opened the gate. We ran straight past him without further explanation and without looking back, adrenaline taking over. Next came the armed police. They tried to block us. We tried a diplomatic approach and in a few minutes, the policeman waved us on. Next came a police security gate with checks for cars and spikes in the path. The skipper Heiss ran in front of me, ran over the spikes with my bag, whilst I tried the pedestrian route, which was currently blocked by police. Distracted by the skipper, I had an opening and I ran for it. Next target was an immigration sign we could see about 500 metres away. We ran as fast as we could and the police fortunately did not give chase. I only got my passport stamped because my name was on an approved list, but for the flight I'd already missed. They didn't notice that I had a different flight to the approved flight and I blagged my way through this hurdle to the next one. The next hurdle was that there were no taxis due to the impending lockdown. I eventually found someone by running around like an idiot with my luggage, 450 rand to take me to the airport uninsured. I gave him 600 and said, make it quick. Adrenaline still going like crazy. I made the flight and left the country legally, so I can go back again. <laughs> my phone was not working except on Wi-Fi, and so I got updates to Mo en route through others. I arrived back to an almost empty Heathrow and made it from disembarking to the empty terminal car park in under 30 minutes. No health checks whatsoever. So after about 10 months on land, I can't wait to get on the water again. Uh, I explained the uh, broken hand earlier on that you see in this picture. Uh, and as they say, that's all folks. So I, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I will let um, Jane have the presentation, the slides and the pictures. And I think the session's been recorded. So Jane, I'll pass back on to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. You thought you were going on a sailing adventure and it turned out to be an awful lot more than that, didn't it? But uh, what was the wildlife, the extraordinary um, meteorological conditions and um, the, the scenery, but also the comfort of the baked bread and the ukulele concerts. Um, what a fabulous oh, time you had. <laughs> and, and to end it all with that drama at Cape Town. Thank you very much. That was a, that was a fascinating um, talk and, and wonderful photos. And I'll now throw it open to the floor. I think I've got everybody on my screen, but possibly not. So um, anyway, it starts. And if, you, if I'm not noticing you, um, just shout. <laughs> Any questions? Has anybody done it before out of interest? Has anybody done, uh, on a, has anybody been on a cruise ship to that part of the world? Well, actually, I have, um, I've been down the Beagle Channel, not on a cruise ship, but Chris and I traveled down through Argentina and we went on a little um, sort of tourist boat down Beagle Channel. So I've got kind of an inkling of the wonderful scenery and, and the oh, world. Yeah. Well, we went on the island sky. I can't see us. Where are we? Oh, I'm sure lots of people have been there. Who's speaking? How close did that bird get to killing uh, that, uh, The skewer that was flying for me, that was probably about, uh, well, it felt about 15 to 20 feet away. 
uh, but I think it flew much closer over my head. Uh, and I was told afterwards by Johnny, the guide, that they don't actually attack people physically. They're just flying very, very close to uh, protect their young. Uh, and as I say, I, I had an 800, I had, the camera I used, if anybody's uh, interested in photography, I had a Canon EOS uh, mirrorless camera. Uh, so it's quite a quiet camera. Oh. And, I, and then I had a 400 millimeter uh, Canon lens, which was a oh, very yeah. expensive, high quality lens. Uh, yeah. And then a two times. Why? Mm -hmm. Was that sorry? Uh, so yeah, so um, that was the uh, the skewer. Mm. Wow. Um, Andrew, thank you very much for a, for a fantastic talk. Uh, do I, uh, Jackie and I have done that uh, passage on a on a cruise ship, I'm afraid. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the soft the soft option. But uh, <laughs> it was fascinating to see the photographs and uh, brought back some memories. I bet it did. Yeah, it's, we saw a lot of cruise ships. Um, in various places, but what we found with the Tekla uh, was we could get in some very small bays that the cruise ships couldn't get into. Yeah, uh, mm. And we seem to, I don't know how true this is, but we seem to get more leeway because we had a much smaller crew. We seem to be allowed to go to places where um, people from the cruise ships weren't allowed to go based on what we were told, particularly in South Georgia. Really? Yeah. yeah, we didn't get to South Georgia, I'm afraid. We got to the Falklands, oh. but uh, didn't oh, okay. get to the South Georgia. Uh, um, there's a hand going up there, I think. Is that Chris? Yes, it's Chris. Um, just to say, <laughs> John and I, we actually went on the um, the nice. Island Sky, which is a noble Caledonia ship. Magic people up there. Uh, in December. Oh, right. 19, uh, 2019. Fantastic. And how, where uh, did we go? From, sorry, we went from Ashwire yeah. uh, to East Falklands and then no, West Falklands and then East Falklands, okay. um, down to South Georgia and down to the Antarctic Peninsula. Yeah. And we came back across Great's Passage. I have to tell you, we had the most gorgeous weather the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and we felt cheated because coming back yes, across yeah. Great's Passage was like crossing the channel. Yeah. <laughs> and we just thought, Oh, it's supposed to be rough here. <laughs> <laughs> so exactly I'm sorry you, you had a rough time, but we didn't. We had a wonderful time. And the crew gave us um, uh, a barbecue on deck in Paradise Bay, which was absolutely fabulous. Oh, lovely. We, had, we actually had a, we, I didn't mention it, but we had a barbecue on deck as well yeah. as having one ashore. And for me, I was just amazed that on a sail ship, um, with uh, you know a lot of wood and the sails that they would do a barbecue but they did and i'm a vegetarian so well yeah. i had corn really while the others were eating the meat but yeah. um it was well, uh, made for a lovely evening so i can imagine the, the noble caledonia ship uh, only had 90 passengers and i think yeah. about 50 crew <laughs> and um lovely. so we're quite a small ship and we got into lots of bays and did a lot of zodiac landings so uh, that okay. was exciting yeah i think we may have, may have seen a few of those zodiacs Mm. Uh, we did hear that the island sky, I think it was late February or m early March, had to take their passengers to the Falklands instead of going back to um, Ushuaia because they were the port was closed and the, all the passengers had to be flown back from the Falklands. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we were lucky. We went in December. <laughs> yes, <laughs> just in time. Yeah. I'm glad to hear they've, they've got the biosecurity going down there. Um, they should have done it in a lot more places earlier on, shouldn't they? But uh, they sound as if they're on top of it. Very much so. Um, it was a, you know, a, quite a long procedure uh, where we were checking. We were teamed up, you know, with a wingman uh, and you checked each other's clothing. Um, and then you were checked when you got to the, got ashore as well. There are random checks and then on South Georgia, uh, they were non-random. You were formally checked before they'd let you off the boat. So you had boots on. You were stepping into buckets of disinfected water on the boat. And then, as you may have heard, we use vacuum cleaners and uh, picks and uh, all sorts of things to get little. Uh, the hardest thing, to be honest, was the uh, when we had been off once Don't and then you were bringing yeah. back bits of plants and seeds into your Velcro on all your weather gear. So then you were having to pick the seeds out of your weather gear. Uh, because that risked inter-island contamination, which, which they uh, wanted to uh, desperately avoid. 
So that was a long procedure before every you know, disembarking of the boat. But, uh, but well worth doing. And, uh, and the rats, you know, I, I didn't mind too much going back to the Falklands. We had a yellow brick on board, which people were tracking. Uh, family, some of you on the call here, were tracking me on the boat. And I think they were wondering, what the hell is this boat doing going back up the Drake Passage towards the Falklands? Um, and you know, eventually we could make contact and tell them what we were doing. Um, but that was to go back for the rat traps. Um, and they had no idea. So Mo and I think others were worried that, um, <laughs> and Dad and my kids are on the call here, were probably worried that uh, something was wrong. Uh, why were we going back up rather than across the Southern Ocean? But uh, we did get the rat traps in the Falklands and then back, back down to South Georgia. And then at that point, I then read a lot more about the rat issues that South Georgia had had and the extreme lengths they'd gone to to get rid of the rat infestation. So you can absolutely understand even though we were only two centimetres too long and it felt a bit of a tough decision at the time. Uh, nevertheless, it, it's absolutely the right thing to do. There's a registered link. Registered link. Yeah. Right, Tony, did you want to say okay, something? I just want to say, thank you very much, Andrew. That was a fantastic talk, much appreciated. Thank you. Um, 55 knot gusts and uh, multiple swells in the South Ocean. Did you ever fear for your life at all? Uh, no, I don't think so. The um, no, no, no is the short answer. We, I thought somebody might hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people were confined to their bunks through seasickness, which was just, just awful. Uh, as I said, I think right at the beginning, two of the ladies spent at least three quarters of the journey uh, in their bunks. And that was from the beginning to the end uh, okay. through seasickness. One flew home, one Irish guy, BBC reporter flew home um, because of severe seasickness, it was so debilitating. I mean, seasickness is anyway, uh, but the level to which these swells brought it on. Uh, I was lucky I didn't get seasick and neither did Stephen that I was bunking with. Um, so we were quite lucky we'd get good night's sleep uh, apart from being thrown out of the bunks. Um, we got quite a lot of bruises, but if I'm honest, I, I did the arc um, in 2015 and I got a lot more bruises on the arc uh, than I did on this um, journey. So I didn't feel, and I felt a lot of confidence in the skipper uh, and the boat itself felt very, uh, very in control. Um, after the bowsprit snapped, I must admit, I felt a bit more nervous after that. Uh, <laughs> that does sort of take away any um, complacency, I think, when that's happened, because um, I, I did not expect that to happen. Um, but I, it never got so far that I feared for my life. I feared for injury, maybe. Um, and there were a few back injuries when people were hauling the sails um, in rough conditions and slipping and sliding on the on a metal deck um, and when they slipped they'd fall onto their back uh, so Stephen um, no. the, the guy I went with actually did some uh, so much back damage he had to take uh, yeah. pills and stay in the bunk for two or three days. Not but, Final quick question as well there's just a uh, when you brought your arm in you brought your hand in the uh, in the cottage when you returned uh, yeah. did, did Ma still get her cup of tea? <laughs> uh, no, I think the carpet drank most of it. And uh, the funny, the funny, but you know, I I was the one catastrophizing about you know watching the yellow brick. They're going back to the Drake Passage, and in my mind, you know, something horrific had happened to Andy. Uh, you know, I, I was less worried of anybody else on the boat, but um, so I was relieved. And then you know, thinking, oh, he's going back through Drake Passage a second time. Um, and then we thought when he got home, it was clean sailing. And when he fell. We were more worried about cleaning up the tea and didn't even um, really think we thought you sort of sprained your hand. And it was a few days later when we realized it wasn't broken or was broken. And in a weird way, thank goodness for COVID, because we got in and out of Lymington A&E with it mm. being x-rayed, seen by a specialist, a hand right. consultant, x-rayed. Uh, and we had to go back and forth twice to Brockenhurst. We mm. did all of that in less than two hours. Mm. <laughs> which, yeah, they were brilliant. They uh, were brilliant. It would never have happened uh, without COVID, sadly. Um, mm -hmm. Super. But, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks again, Andrew. It's fantastic that one. No, thanks for the feedback. Anyone else? Just moving across in case I. Ah, oh, um, Neil. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Brilliant, brilliant talk and wonderful photos. I uh, wondered once you found your land legs are uh, getting a bit impatient, and COVID allows for. Um, for us all to go somewhere else other than just Lymington, uh, where, where would you think of going next? So, uh, so Mo and I got married in September, and so we've got a honeymoon to do at some point. Not sure, <laughs> not sure what uh, we'll choose for that, but we've, uh, 
I mentioned we've just bought a boat. Um, it's an Oceanus 30.1. Uh, which is being built for the boat show. So come September, October, we'll have a, a boat and we're going to keep it in the Haven Marina. Uh, and part of what we're thinking of is COVID allowing some trips across, maybe to the Channel Islands, to France, uh, maybe around the coast of the UK, which is something I've never done. Um, so I'd like to maybe do that with Mo. Uh, I'm retired, but Mo isn't. So that's another consideration for longer trips together. Uh, but... Um, we did talk about the uh, Northwest Passage as a possibility, um, but in terms of now we've bought a boat, I think it's more likely that we'll do some of the UK coastline. Yeah. I've done parts of it, but not much, and I know it's gorgeous, uh, and probably across to France. Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe also one thing I've been reading about is, um, I've done it once before, but going down um, to the Med and just sailing from, the, from here down to uh, the Med uh, and spend some time down there, but again, that depends on at work and what we can do between us. So yeah. those, are, those are probably the ideas that are in our heads at the moment. Well, many congratulations on uh, last September. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That was, that was another brilliant effort. <laughs> it was, yeah, we just slipped it in amongst all the changes of rules and regulations, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, we married on a Saturday and then the Monday, there were no more weddings, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so close usual yeah. form for you Andy by the sounds of it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, bad luck you don't want to go sailing with me <laughs> not inspiring me <laughs> anybody anybody else any questions so I'm moving back between two screens ah oh, right um, John hello yes it's John here and uh, Hi, John. I just, uh, bring back memories of our, our uh, cruise uh, we luckily included South Georgia where we really did want to go and saw some of the beaches with thousands and literally thousands of penguins on yeah. uh, straight out. You wonder how they survive. They must have cats uh, out, out to feed all the time. Um, but it also brings back memories of um, when we brought Sarah two back from um, Southeast Asia and through reunion down the east coast of South Africa and Durban, etc. Yeah. And uh, got into Simon's Town, which was a quite a big naval base in the old days. Yeah. Chris and I spent Christmas there, but they wouldn't let us clear out to go up uh, up to St. Helena. So we had to take the boat round to Cape Town. But the, the bureaucracy red tape um, was, was, was quite difficult in South Africa. Uh, and you had to file what we used to call a flight plan with every dimension of the boat, where we'd been, where we were going, what day we were leaving, and then of course, <laughs> weather changed so we had to go and then revise that and so on but um the royal cape town yacht club was was out on a limb i remember walking for loads of times through the dockyard uh, and go to immigration and customs so uh, yeah that was, was a good talk to to remember all that oh fantastic i'm glad it broke away some memories i mean one thing we we I, I came to my mind as i was speaking was the this cruise ship the aida that had let people off and six people had covid and I think it was only just a month or so back that South Africa peaked over a million mm. uh, COVID cases. So, and Antarctica's got COVID as well. So, you know, from, from that beginning of uh, Chris and Acuna being worried about their population of 400 and not letting any ships disembark because they, they felt they wouldn't be able to have any resilience and no cases in Cape Town, but being held there because they were worried. And, and now what we see, of course, so, um, but I was very lucky to get back. Uh, the rest of the crew, by the way, uh, got back on uh, repatriation flights. So although South African airspace closed um, and Tecla was still in quarantine, uh, there was still a number of uh, crew on board, paying crew, a couple of Americans um, who'd wanted to go traveling around the world. This was part of the beginning of their travel around the world, which uh, came to a complete halt. Uh, some Dutch actually, girls. It was their honeymoon, that couple, and they had yeah. never sailed before. Oh. Uh, I can't yeah. think of a... And she was uh, one of the ones who was in her bunk for yeah. three quarters oh. of the time, bless her. And she was a strict vegan, so... Yeah, she um, did not have a good time. The food was quite difficult as well. But, um, but you know, she's just still smiling at the end of it. And, uh, oh. yeah. But, yeah, they had to... Uh, they got put on repatriation flights about a week after I got back, including Stephen, the, the chap who'd gone with me. Um, and then the poor permanent crew uh, then sailed Tecla back uh, to Holland um, and, and onwards but um, so everybody got out eventually uh, and I probably wouldn't have had to sail back to the Azores via the Azores but uh, that's what it felt like at the time we we're being told if we weren't allowed into Cape Town we would have had to sail back. 
And that felt a bit rough, you know, having engaged. I only proposed to Mo just before I went. So it felt a bit rough. <laughs> 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 away for another three months, it wouldn't have been too good a fiance, really. <laughs> she still married me. Still married me. <laughs> Well, um, several people have left, but I've been looking at the chat and it's all very appreciative. Um, yes, we've had a very good evening and thoroughly enjoyed the talk and, and the photos. So um, does anyone else have any final questions before, before we call it a day? No? Okay, but no, it's been great fun. Thank you very much. And thanks also to Mo for supporting with the, um, the tech <laughs> as we <laughs> went through. We did, we did we did we did okay we did all right yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um we fin finally got there jane i think we tried to organize this a few times so um, we did yes i think it started in november didn't it so yes but really uh, pleased we got there in the end and uh yeah look forward to um bumping into you in the club in Duke. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah very excited to actually yeah. see you guys at the club and out sailing <laughs> well then everybody keep safe yeah, yeah and she's safe. and Thanks Thank everyone for, for joining Thanks us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. So it will be on the club's YouTube in due course. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks Bye -bye. for organizing, Jane. Thank you. Bye. Bye.